for World War II, you were drafted, or was he enlisted, one or the other. Of course, being the, the head of the house, I was drafted, I didn't enlist. I got the letter from Uncle Sam, greetings, your go for induction. So I went to Allentown for induction. Then I, from there I went to uh, Indian Town Gap, is where all the recruits come in. And they decide where you're gonna go, whether you're going in the Army, the Navy, the Marines. Everyone in line in front of me was, I wanna go to the Air Corps. I'm sorry we're filled up, I'm sorry we're filled up. He came to me and he said, well, would you like to go, soldier? I said, that's up to you. I said, uh, I didn't ask to come here. <laughs> I said, so I'm here, put me where the hell you want me. He said, you make a good air corps, man. <laughs> Once you finish school, you go, you start with the civilians that's building the plane. And you go through each phase of the plane from the fuselage, the electronics, the, the hydraulics, the instruments, and all that stuff. You went through the classes and you, when you graduate, the plane is yours, but they have to get a pilot for it. So uh, they were rounding up the pilot. Uh, they sent us to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and took the inside of the plane out to all the bomb racks and they built two new rooms inside the plane for radar equipment. On top of that they got two more flight engineers. Now it's uh, very unusual, three flight engineers for the one plane only because nobody was allowed near the plane. It was a spy plan. We took our training at Marchfield, California, Riverside, California. And doing our training and all, we went out one morning to take the one plane and fly it and it was fogged in. We couldn't get out of the runway. So the afternoon came and the other crew went down and took the plane. Never heard from them since. They were all killed. Like I said, they were all friends. The plane would go along the coast of Japan and pick out the radar equipment. See, all the anti-aircraft that were shot up at us, they, they were all radar controlled. The job on our plane you had three college graduates from Yale University. Uh, they called them radar countermeasurement. There were two of them, and the other was a radar navigator. They were handpicked and put on that plane. Three flight engineers, co-pilot and pilot, and a gunner, and a radio operator. In other words, there was six non-commissioned officers and five commissioned officers on that plane. When they spot the hole, the, the, the radar, see the radar equipment that the chapter used was mobile. They moved at night, you know, in different places. Our job was to find out where the hole was between the radar equipment that we could get the bombers in without being detected. Then we would come back, bring that information to headquarters, and the second plane would go out and lead, lead the bombers. The bombers would take off from Guam to the inside then, and they congregate off the coast of Japan and wait for us. 
to wait on him, to pick out the hole and lead them through so they could drop their bombs and then come back out again. We were first in, last out, but the second one over Nakasaki, we were. And that's the one we landed, it was on near the middle of August 1945. The atomic bomb went off August the 6th and Hiroshima, but the second one went off in a week later, and that's the one that we were on when we landed. They were running over to us saying that the Japanese surrendered. So I'm on the two train with a, about a thousand of the soldiers. The guy, lieutenant, comes walking through the thing, calling my name, Mr. Clavey, or Sergeant Clavey. I says, yeah, I have a telegram here for you. Your mother just died. So I didn't know where I was. I was on a troop train, no destination in sight. They wouldn't tell you where you were headed. I thought, well, if I see something familiar and we stop, I'm getting out. So we stopped at Cincinnati, Ohio, the train stopped, the troop train. I thought, Cincinnati, Ohio, that's in the east. I'm getting off. So I got off. And uh, I went into the Red Cross and explained what was going on. They got me a train ticket. So I got on the train and I headed for Pittsburgh. And the MP, military police, comes through with the conductor. And he said, well, where's your meal voucher? I said, I don't have any. He said, so what do you mean you don't have any? I said, my mother died, I'm on the way home. He said, that's what they all say. He said, wait here till I come back. And he collected all the tickets, came back and sat down and put the handcuffs on me. He said, you're going, I'm turning you over to the military police district at the next stop. So at the next stop, they wouldn't handle me. They said it's out of their jurisdiction and I had to take them into Pittsburgh. So I back on the train with the military police. And we hit Pittsburgh. Now his word, he was wrong. He said, I'm going to take the handcuffs off you because I got to go back and get the tickets off the conductor and all and the vouchers. He said, you wait here until I come back. So he walks down and the train was pulling into the station and the people start getting up out of their seats, grabbing their luggage and everything. I politely got up and walked off the train. All I could see was a gun in his hand. Come back, come back. Well, I didn't come back. I didn't come back for 30 days. So anyway, I got off. Got made the arrangements, had my mother buried, had my sister taken care of her to my cousin. But she wouldn't take me because I was in the service. The Air Corps was the, the prime target for them all to get in. First of all, you're, you're assigned with the crew. You're not uh, military marching all the time. You stick together as a crew. I couldn't care less to go back to Guam and Saipan. What we used to do in the Air Corps, you couldn't get away with it in the military, in the cavalry or infantry. We checked the different islands to find out what their menu was for dinner. And we'd fly there, either the Kwajalein, Johnson Island, 
the side pad to the end, different places. Whichever had the best food, you know, what's on the menu. <laughs> but that was fun. But the worst part about that, you had a lot of Polynesians and natives too that were in the service. And the biggest fear that you had was when you were sleeping at night, they'd come in, stab you, kill you, take your clothing, put it on themselves and go into the mess hall for dinner and breakfast on the island. Before you come in to Guam, there's another island there, it's called Rhoda. And they never mention that. But any time we'd come in for a landing, if you had any ammunition or anything left, you shot it down in the rotor. Drop the, if you had a couple extra bombs you wanted to get rid of, drop it on before you come in and land on Guam. They kept doing that for a year or so. When the war was over, there was a colonel with 50, 1500, I was going to say, soldiers, Japanese soldiers that were still living there. Out there all that bombing. This land is your land, and this land is my land. From the California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me.